This is the Tom Hartman Program. Welcome back. Tom Hartman here with you. There's a, an absolutely astonishing article in the New York Times back on June 23rd. Uh, that was uh, six days ago. It took us uh, a few days to, to, uh, to chop up the video and share this with you. This is all uh, you know, New York Times video. Um, Bruce Jessen and James Mitchell were two psychologists who were hired by the Bush administration to come up with an interrogation program that would get more information out of suspected terrorists. And, uh, you know, they, they viewed it that way. Uh, the rest of us viewed it as torture. In fact, one of the people under their care or under the care of that they had prescribed died of uh, hypothermia, apparently. Uh, others were ultimately released without charges. Um, but uh, I just wanted to share some of the, some of the pieces of this uh, that the New York Times shared with all of us. The first is the long-lasting effects of the torture uh, with uh, some recounts by, by plaintiffs, by victims. Uh, here, here is the clip. Do you think that the enhanced interrogation techniques could result in long-term harm? No. Why is that? It never did. I don't know that for a fact. It, mm -hmm. It's one of those things that you can establish. If, if they're out there and that happened, then, you know, show me the data. I think none of the men that I was involved in with while I was involved with them, experienced anything that would have led to that. I'm very convinced of that. Have you suffered any psychological injuries uh, as a result of your captivity in Cobalt? Papa? Of course. What are they? Mahom. I call a beast. Nightmares. Can you tell me about these nightmares? I call a beast. It comes uh, to me during my sleep, and as if I'm still imprisoned in that horrible uh, place, uh, and uh, still shackled. In addition to recurring nightmares, Mr. Binsu describes feelings of anxiety, fear, and worry. Salim also describes ongoing effects. When asked about his feelings of isolation, he responds. I don't feel like being with people. I like being by myself, and I don't like walking around to see people. I feel like I'm so weak and I can't do anything. So this is this is this is pretty pretty extraordinary, and. Um, the, the, the stories, uh, Nate, let's go to clip number three. This is the description of the tor torture me methods. Uh, these are the torture architects, uh, you know, laying this out and, um, interspersed with detainee testimony. Uh, again, uh, the, uh, well, a actually, actually let's, let's, um, you know, I'm 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 I, I'm not going to do any more of the clips. I'm I'm concerned that we're using too much of the New York Times' content here. But d let me just tell you the story here. This is from the from the New York Times, and I cur encourage you to go to the New York Times website and and find this article. It's called "The Torturers Speak" by the editorial board, and uh, they write the men Bruce Jessen and James Mitchell strike a professional pose, dressed in suits and ties, speaking matter of factly. They describe the barbaric acts they and others inflicted on the captives who were swept up indiscriminately and then waterboarded, slammed into walls, locked into coffins, and more. When pushed to confront the horror and uselessness of what they had done, writes the editorial board of the New York Times, about uh, Jessen and Mitchell, the psychologists fell back on one of the oldest justifications of wartime. We were soldiers doing what we were instructed to do, Dr. Jessen said. Perhaps, writes the New York Times editorial board, but they were also soldiers whose contracting business was paid more than $81 million to torture people. This, I mean, you know, George W. Bush, this, this uh, sociopath who 
lied us into the war in Iraq and who, who used 9-11 as an opportunity to, to attack the second poorest country in the world, even after they offered to arrest bin Laden and hand him over. Just because he wanted a war, just because in 99 he had told his biographer, Mickey Herskowitz, George W. Bush told the guy who was writing his autobiography, A Charge to Keep, the book that, that, that they released just before the election so that George W. Bush could be a great author. The guy who was writing the book, as George W. Bush, you know, hours and hours of tapes of George W. Bush, and this was before he had even announced that he was running for president. George W. Bush is saying, if I become president, I'm going to have a war, and I'm going to go to war with Iraq. My daddy blew that opportunity. I'm paraphrasing here. We've got the we've got the clip of Cindy Sheehan, but I think it'll probably take longer to dig it out and play it than it's worth. I, I can just do this from memory. Uh, basically, George W. Bush said that his daddy, by ha only having a hundred-hour war, you know, a very short war, in in you know pushing pushing Saddam's guys out of Kuwait, he blew it. Because he didn't have a war going on when the election happened. And if you've got a war going on when an election is happening, then you've got a lot more power, you've got a lot more authority, and, and people tend to rally around you. And George W. Bush knew this, so he created this war. And the result of this is that the torturers, now they're being sued in Spokane, Washington, the trial starts September 5th, uh, by some of their victims. But this is a national disgrace. This is a national horror. This is, this is something that we all should be paying attention to. And I think it's great that the authorization for military force that this Republican-controlled House committee just moved to, uh, you know, in fact, this is uh, Jennifer Schlottes uh, writes, a room full of wows after House Appropriations Committee uh, Republicans adopted a AUMF, the Authorization for Use of Military Force, repeal by Barbara Lee. It's incredible. We'll be back.